Welcome to this episode of Unraveling Adoption, an intentional space to delve into adoption's complexities together. I'm Beth Syverson. I'm an adoptive mom of an open-minded and empathetic 20-year-old son, Joe, who is launching as an adult. I'm walking beside him while working on my own personal growth and healing. I'm also a certified coach, helping primarily adoptive parents. Joe and I are committed to helping anyone impacted by adoption, and we want to help the general public understand adoption's complexities better too. So listeners, are you in touch with your ancestors? Do you ever seek or receive messages from your lineage, whether or not you know who they were in real life? Today's guest is Dr. Helena Soholm, and she might help us open up our minds about the power of the ancestor's voice in our life. Typically, our guests at Unraveling Adoption are adoptees, and occasionally we bring in birth parents or adoptive parents. Helena is none of these, but she has helped dozens of adoptees as a Korean mudong, or shaman. She immigrated to the U.S. from South Korea at age nine and spent her young adulthood studying psychology and theology. She received a master's in theological studies from Harvard Divinity School, then pursued another master's in existential phenomenological psychology at Seattle University. Whew, I don't (laughs) even have any idea what that's about, but that sounds amazing and interesting. Today, she combines her passion for contemporary forms of shamanism and psychology, integrating them in a unique way. In 2018, she became both a doctor of psychology and a mudang, Korean shaman. I've never met someone quite like Helena, and I'm excited for you to meet her too. She will share about her awakening to the ancestors and how she helps adoptees move along their own path through communicating with their ancestors. So welcome to Unraveling Adoption, Helena. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you, Beth. Thank you for having me. Does anyone else have anything similar to your credentials? It's like (laughs) so unusual, Pat. I suppose I think it's good to think that there are others like you doing the kinds of work that you are doing. Uh And I know of other Korean American shamans now coming up in the world. And of course, there are many, many healers of all forms. Sure doing wonderful healing work. I just have followed the path that I have yeah. and here's where it, it led to. It's fascinating because you have both Western and Eastern, you know, the science-based and the, the deeply spiritual and you've combined it in such a unique way. I love it. Mm. Okay. When you were growing up, did you dream of becoming a shaman? Did you want to be a psychiatrist or go into psychology or what was your dream when you were a child? So I was a very odd child. (laughs) (laughs) Now I understand why I had the childhood and the family system that I grew up in. Mm -hmm. But as a child, you don't understand these things. Right. I do have, let's say, spiritual gifts in my genetic line. Mm. So my mother was a single parent. And even while we were in Korea, I was surrounded by women who were intuitives. My mother had very powerful spiritual gifts that she never quite utilized in a professional way or even, hmm, I guess, expressed in her personal life. But she and I often talked about spirits Mm. and I have a lot of aunties and they all talked about their dreams. Like when Mm. we spend time together, we would wake up in the morning and the first things that we're talking about are dreams and who we saw in our dreams. And that would be very meaningful. Mm. So that's part of the Korean culture. It's a very shamanistic culture, okay. but it was also unique to our family. Mm. So the women in our family are intuitive. And then by later walking the path of a mudang, a shaman, I understood what was in my ancestral line that I didn't know about before. Okay. So you have other mudangs in your line or just other people that were very open? There may be mudang. I'm not sure about that, but there was a deep uh, devotion to the indigenous spirituality. Oh, okay. In my mother's side of the family is from North Korea in Pyongyang. Okay. And I hear they were an aristocratic family. And my great-grandmother apparently kept a very large shrine to the indigenous spirits. And she prayed to the seven stars, the Big Dipper deity, which is a big deity in the Korean cosmology, Mm -hmm. to conceive my grandfather, who is the only son. So I know that they worship these nature spirits. Mm -hmm and ancestral spirits. Now, I know at least here, many, many Korean Americans are Christian. There's a lot of Korean churches Mm -hmm. here. Was your family Christian too? Yes. So here's the story that gets very interesting. So I'm born with these kind of natural spiritual gifts. I was always intuitive. 
Mm, I've had premonition dreams ever since I was a very young child. Mm. And as I developed these skills, I would have dreams where I would understand the nature of a situation or a person before I could know it in my human way. Mm. So these things guided me throughout life to not fall prey to uh, dangerous situations or people. So these guidances have always been present. So my grandfather on my maternal side, like I mentioned, Mm -hmm. he's from North Korea during the Korean War. He had a family already, existing family in Pyongyang. Mm -hmm. And of course, the communists were going after the upper classes. Mm -hmm. So they were in danger. So my grandfather and the oldest son, my uncle, decided to run away for a few days to be safe. Okay. And he left his first wife and other children there. And then came down to a different area to the south. Okay. Well, they thought they were going to go back in a very short period of time. However, the way that the war turned out, they drew the lines and they couldn't go back. Mm. So my grandfather came to south with his uh, firstborn son. Okay. And they were never to be united again with the North Korean family. Okay. And then he eventually met my grandmother, who also lost her husband in the war. And she had prior children from the prior marriage. And then they got together and they had the rest of the family, including my mother. Okay. So my grandmother was the Christian person and she converted my grandfather to Christianity. And that side of the family, I believe, were like fourth generation Christians. So deep Christianity running through that family. Ah. And my entire life has been infused by Christianity. Mm -hmm. When I was in Korea, I went to church often, multiple times a week. And then throughout my time growing up in America, we also were a part of a church community. And like you mentioned, a lot of Korean American immigrants are Christian Mm -hmm. because it's also a support network for them. So Mm -hmm. you leave your families, you come here, you know, and You don't have family here. And for my mother, she was a single parent. Mm -hmm. So the church community was really our extended Uh, family. And I spent most of my childhood in church camps, going to church, church events, youth, Sunday school. And there was a time in my life when I was considering becoming an ordained minister. Okay. Okay. Now, the Korean Christian churches, do they have room for shamanism there? No. There's no room, but... The churches are very shamanistic in the way that they worship. So if you know of the Pentecostal and evangelical churches in America, they work with spirit energy and they speak in tongues. But in Korean churches, even if you are part of a more conservative church, they may still engage in speaking in tongues. Oh, and that is also a shamanistic. Yes, it's shamanistic in its flavor because it's syncretism. These religions coming together together. And expressing itself differently than when Christianity went somewhere else. Oh, interesting. Fascinating. Now, how did your family like it when you decided to become a shaman? (laughs) Did that go over well? Um, (laughs) So my mother had these gifts that never got realized. She knew me. My mother knew who I was and what I had. Okay. So it's been one of her biggest fears that I would become a mudang. Ah. This is a fear she held in her heart deeply throughout my life. Mm. And there was friction in our relationship because of that. Yeah. Reminds me of Elsa in Frozen. Is that how you felt? Oh, yes, yes. Like Mm -hmm. you needed to wear the gloves. (laughs) Like I have so much power Mm. inside of me and you had to kind of hold it in. Mm -hmm. Did it feel like that to you? Mm. Hold it in. I didn't do very well. (laughs) I also have a (laughs) very independent minded Uh, personality and it caused a lot of friction, Mm -hmm. not just in my family system, but throughout my life i i've always been an independent thinker so the initiation took place in 2018 Mm -hmm. all the way through my late 20s and into my 30s my shamanic what we call shamanic illness Mm -hmm. sometimes it can be expressed into a very severe illness psychologically or Mm -hmm. physically when people are going through this experience I started feeling different energies Mm -hmm. let's just call it i felt different entities slipping in to my being. Oh. Okay, so shamanic illness, mm-hmm. is this when you're not expressing your gifts or is it some sort of curse? I'm not sure what you're meaning. It's not a curse. It's like spirits become very interested in you oh. because you have your own spirits, but also other types of spirits that need help. Oh, so the other spirits were glomming onto you and then making you like literally sick? It, it could be. Okay. Uh, it could be the case that shamans experienced that. Uh, in my case, 
I was suffering from a lot of nightmares mm. where I saw spirits coming towards me. Ooh. But also when I would sit and meditate, I can feel my helping spirits coming in. Okay. Possessing. Okay. And they're positive spirits, right? Yes, because they're the ones who are going to protect you and help you do the healing work. Okay. But you believe there are also negative spirits? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So your helper spirits were trying to protect you, yes. but creating kind of wild dreams. Mm -hmm. And that was probably very disconcerting. Yeah. So it can express itself into confusion, sometimes psychotic events, you know. Mm -hmm. For me, what helped me was that I already knew a lot of theory about mental health. Okay. I was already a practicing psychotherapist by then. Yeah. Okay. But I was in the midst of writing my dissertation, which was already late. Okay. I was procrastinating on that. <laughs> so madly stressed about that. And then working full time as a psychotherapist. At the time, I was working at an art college doing counseling with the students there. Okay. And in addition, I also had a private practice. Okay. So I was stressed to the max and uh, the energies kept building and building. But this is the ancestral piece. Throughout this period, my grandmother, who passed away long before, started showing up in my dreams. Mm -hmm. I believe this was a ancestor who's further back than my grandmother. Okay. But I think she took on the face of my grandmother. So you would recognize? Because that's the grand. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, that's the grandmother I know. So she's like a compilation of the different ancestors. Okay. And she started showing up. And in one dream, I was in Korea and I was shopping with my family for a white hanbok. Hanbok is the traditional costume of Korea. Mm -hmm. The beautiful dress that uh, women wear. Yes. Okay, yes, I know what that looks like. Yes. Uh, and hanbok is a general term for the men's and women's oh. wear. Okay. Uh -huh. And I thought, what a strange dream, because the only understanding of white hanbok that I had at the time was that you wear it during funerals. Oh, hmm. That was the traditional color that you would wear at funerals. Okay. So I thought, it's someone passing away? Mm. But later I understood because the mudang, the shamans, wear white hanbok during ceremony. Oh. It's a symbol of purity. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So they were saying, uh, knock, knock. We want you to be a shaman. Yes. And did you say, okay? Or <laughs> did you say, I'm busy? Yes, it was, it was hard. Um, but... It's kind of like, if I don't take that step, I would never be happy. Yeah. I knew this was my calling. That's like becoming your authentic self. Yes. Wow. 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 Okay. So you eventually finished your dissertation because I read that you got a doctor <laughs> of psychology yes. in the middle of all this. Wow. And mm -hmm. it seems like it all happened all at the same time. All of this culminated at the same time. It did. So I went to Korea alone. My husband was supportive of me going, even though he didn't understand. He's okay. Danish American. He came to America when he was 17, 18 okay. from Denmark and grew up in a very secular mm -hmm. society. Danes are very secular people. Mm -hmm. So he didn't understand, but he knew that this is something I had to do. Okay. So I went to Korea alone. I didn't tell any of my family there. Oh. And I didn't tell my mother who was alive back oh. then. Oh that I was going because I didn't want any disturbances and energetically. Okay. And my grandmother who was in my dream. She showed me, and this is the most beautiful thing. She actually pointed it out to me, the exact person that I need to work with as a oh. teacher. Wow. So the spirits are very concrete hmm. that way. They're not just like general. Hmm. They can be very detailed about what they want from you. Wow. And I followed. I went to Korea had the initiation, which took all day, and I stayed with my teacher and other shamans for the whole week. And then I returned. That was summer. I came back, and I finished up my dissertation and really started my new life wow. with the support of the spirits and the people around wow. me. Wow. Fascinating. We're going to get to the adoptee part in just a moment. Yes. But what do you say to people that say, it's a bunch of hooey that you can talk to ancestors. Like this is not real. Mm -hmm. There's, I'm sure a lot of atheists or agnostics or humanists, mm -hmm. they're like, you need to live in reality. What are you doing? Hmm. What do you say to people like that? Yes, I suppose. I mean, everyone has a right to their opinion, but it's really the direct experience that I want people to trust. Mm -hmm. So I have no interest in trying to convince anybody okay. of a, a way of thinking that they can't understand. Mm -hmm. But I know that if they have an experience, uh -huh. then they can understand. And I teach methods of decolonizing our minds mm. to gain our indigenous way of thinking again. Mm. So it is science. 
in that. And by the way, there are reputable scientists, Western scientists, mm-hmm. who have studied paranormal or energetic mm-hmm. spiritual phenomenon okay. using Western scientific methods. Mm-hmm. So there is body of research mm-hmm. that you can tap into and learn about. Okay. However, my way of teaching spirituality is every one of us has ancestry going back to people who lived with earth-based practices. Sure. Okay. If you go back far enough. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Everyone lived uh, in connection to the earth and the cycles and rituals. Mm -hmm. And it's a different way of existing in the world Mm -hmm. where it's not one or the other. Mm -hmm. But if you open up to that world, and I will give examples from my own life of the shocking things that have happened to me Mm -hmm. that I could not imagine. Okay. Give us an example of something like that that happened to you. Well, okay. We now go into the adoption okay. and the adoptees. Mm-hmm. So I have no personal connection to adoption. I'm not an adoptee. And actually, I've really not thought about adoption much mm-hmm. or adoptees, mm-hmm. other than the average person who might have known people who are mm-hmm. adopted. But I did start my journey as an immigrant with Korean adoptees mm-hmm. on the flight from South Korea to the Seattle area, we came along with a group of Korean babies who were finding their new homes in America. And I remember my mother, actually, because she loved babies, and she was playing with the babies on the plane and actually held some Mm. of them. So my first images of coming to America was with adoptees. Wow. That's really interesting that you remember that and that that forms such a strong memory. I can imagine a bunch of babies mm-hmm. lined up in mm-hmm. the seats. Wow. Okay. Yes. And I didn't have an understanding other than, oh, wow. You know, uh, I was a child. I was nine years old. And then I have two friends I remember from childhood in America who are Korean adoptees. Mm-hmm. They both had mothers who were Korean. Oh, okay. And fathers who were Caucasian and served in the military. So that's how the parents met Mm -hmm. in Korea. And again, I didn't have any kind of awareness Mm -hmm. other than that. No, it must be at least nice to have a mother who can give them that culture. So I shared this culture with them. Mm -hmm. And I remember both of them were able to speak Korean. And, you know, they had the cultural piece. But then later I started meeting Korean adoptees who were not connected at all. Mm -hmm. And started learning about the painful childhoods of having lost their original culture. Yeah, that's more often the case, no? Is that what you've experienced with Korean? Yeah, they're more often separated from their language and their culture. Yeah. Yes. So in 2018, when I returned from my initiation, one of the most powerful visions I experienced was of seeing all the Korean ancestors of the adoptees. Mm. They showed up in a large group, thousands of them. How did you know they were the adoptees' ancestors? They just told you? Yes. Okay. It's more like just a deep knowing. Just a knowing who they are. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to connect. Wow. They wanted to connect to all their children, grandchildren. Mm. I woke up from the state. I thought, wow, I didn't think that I could do this alone, of course. I mean, I alone cannot (laughs) help everybody. But I thought, wow, what a what a powerful vision. Mm-hmm. Then when I opened my shamanic practice, many, many Korean adoptees started showing up in my practice. Wow. I didn't know. You didn't advertise for it or write an article or anything. They just sort of were drawn to you. <gasps> wow. And it makes sense at the basic level. If you are an adoptee trying to connect to your culture, this is a reasonable way that you would want to connect to the spirituality, right? Sure. Because many people are also trying to heal themselves mm-hmm. and they want to find ways of healing themselves through their indigenous spirituality. Mm-hmm. And I thought, wow, this is almost overwhelming. Mm-hmm. So many stories, not just from the original loss, but so much abuse that took place after mm-hmm from either growing up in an abusive adoptive home oh, yeah. to the cultural abuses from racism mm-hmm. of being different. And it was overwhelming. And I started doing ceremonies with them. And something interesting happening there was that when I tapped into the ancestral energy, I had a lot of anger show up. Oh. Anger from the very, very old ancestors who were very disappointed with the way that Korea behaved as a country in sending away their children. Yeah. Yep. And if you know any of the individual stories involved in that, there's some very not so nice behavior 
I, I'll just say it nicely. Like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but very abusive behavior, very shameful behavior, and the ancestors were very angry. And it took me by surprise, and it took some of the adoptees by surprise because they were there to connect and yeah. if that more grief or sadness would show up, but I'd just be flowing over with mm. anger, connecting to that energy. Did the adoptees think they were angry at them? No, no. Or was it clear they were angry at the system? Yes. I explained where the anger was coming from. Okay. And that the ancestors, deities or the spirits were very angry mm. at the way our collective ancestors behaved. Wow. wow. So that started happening. And then last year, I felt the first call to take a group of Korean diaspora back to Korea for a pilgrimage. Mm. A lot of the adoptees told me that when they engaged and connecting with the culture again, a lot of the institutions would have these kind of touristy cultural tours. Yeah. Go to your homeland and yeah. Yes, home motherland trips mm -hmm. and they would get on a bus and just show them the sites just like they were tourists, but they never received anything spiritual. Mm -hmm. This is also because it's a taboo topic in Korea. There's a huge stigma against shamans in Korea. Mm -hmm. Most of the shamans are women and there are thousands of them okay. and they're often hated because of their manipulative economic practices. Oh. Many of the shamans are quite corrupt mm -hmm. and capitalistic. Really? And they will charge anywhere from ten to forty thousand dollars for a ceremony. Oh my gosh! Wow. So <laughs> there is a lot of healing that needs to take place at that level as well. So the Koreans don't trust the shamans, and then you're coming in as a Korean American mm -hmm. into Korea. How do they like you doing that? Well, I introduce myself as a psychotherapist and a psychologist. Okay. <laughs> rather than leading with mudang because they would not take okay, me seriously. Okay. So they don't need to know that part. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, okay, the ancestors want connection. Mm -hmm. Let's do it right. And this took years. Uh, so Beth, when I talk about my childhood and the weird experiences I had, I would have these kind of a deeper knowing. I was a child. I, I was mature because I was also the firstborn in a single parent household, okay. immigrant household where my mother didn't speak English. Okay. You had to so do I everything. played interpreter. Yes, yes I did everything, okay. you know. Mm -hmm. So there was a certain level of maturity, but also I used to get these kind of deeper knowings. And one of them was that I would keep my language. Oh. So I made an effort. Okay. I was nine, which was helpful. I went to school in Korea, but you can still lose the language oh, yeah. if you don't utilize it. Yeah, use it or lose it. Yes. So I remember making an effort. Mm -hmm. Then as soon as I received opportunities to go back to Korea, I would go. Mm -hmm. And I even lived there during my 20s for a year teaching English okay. and really reconnected. And then during my late 30s and then into my early 40s, started going regularly to make connections and build a network. Okay. And it was helpful to have that language, but there was a very distinct voice when I was young telling me, keep your language mm. because you need it. And so now you're able to take these Korean adoptees who have completely lost their language and you're able to be like a, a docent, a, a guide yes. and spiritual guide, all of it. Yes. Wow. That's kind of a unique set of tools you have, like very unique. Well, you got to learn how to listen. Uh -huh. And then this is the technique I like to teach people that I believe everybody has a purpose. And just by simply learning to have a listening practice, uh -huh. you can listen for what is needed from you. Okay. And you can allow that to guide you in the world. Wow. Okay. And when you have had these ceremonies with adoptees, what have been the outcomes? What have they come home with? Well, just at the basic psychological level, you feel nurtured. Mm. So I've made an effort to meet and create a community back in Korea, meet up a very loving, nurturing people. Mm. Because sometimes, not just the top Ds, but the Korean American diaspora, like myself, also experience alienation sure. because they don't speak the language well enough. Yeah. And old school Korea was brusque, mm. if I had to describe the personality. Mm -hmm. It's a trauma response. Mm. There's a lot of cultural trauma from the war, mm -hmm. colonization, and people were a bit rough. Mm -hmm. But that's not, of course, innately Korean. It's a result mm -hmm. of all the traumas that happened mm -hmm. to the culture. But just last trip with the pilgrimage, you notice how much softer people have become. Mm. And there are beautiful people out there who are also mm. 
wanting to do this work with me. Um, as an example, in order to do my ceremony, I need musicians okay, right. to help me get into an altered state of consciousness. And I do that through music and dance and jumping up and down. Mm -hmm. So when I was looking for people to help me, I don't have a network in Korea. I, you know, I don't know people there. Mm -hmm. And I had somebody on my social media that I knew about, but we had never talked to each other before. Mm -hmm. And his name is Professor Tongwon Kim. And he's a traditional Korean musician, percussionist. Mm -hmm. He also played with Yo-Yo Ma Silk Road Ensemble oh, for many right. years. Yes, yes. And he was on my Facebook friends list. And I thought, oh, he would surely know some people. Mm -hmm. So I reached out to him last year and asked, would you lend me two of your students who had a very small budget <laughs> who can assist me in a ceremony? And he kept probing and asking further questions. And finally, he just mm -hmm. said, I would like to help. Oh, wow. And I was like, I, I can't afford to pay you. But he did it anyway because wow. he wanted to. And so he and his former student came to the ceremony to assist. And we had a beautiful ceremony. Oh. So at the basic level, they're nurtured, okay. welcomed by people in Korea. Psychologically, mm. that's huge. Very, very huge. Okay. But sometimes the ceremony is just a trigger mm. in a way that I can't know. My job is to just provide the space mm -hmm. and people's lives, how they change after that is out of my hands mm -hmm. and they take on a form of their own, the energies. Yeah. And um, I love seeing how it unfolds in people's lives, whether it's healing yeah. or further connection, or now they feel more comfortable going back to Korea. That's one of my main purposes mm -hmm. is to help them feel at ease in Korea so they can go back and go forth. Back. Yeah. I know a lot of Korean adoptees are unable to find their birth families mm -hmm. in real life. It's just really, really hard. Mm. But does this provide them some sort of connection that they might be seeking? Do they crave that connection with their lineage? And does that kind of fill that need, even if they can't reunite in real life? I think so. So even for ordinary people who were raised in their biological families, I don't know anyone beyond my grandparents' generation. I suppose. Mm -hmm. It's rare that you would know the ancestors back. Mm -hmm. For adoptees, I help them do the connection to the ancestors by ritual, mm -hmm. even if they have no idea of who that is. Yeah. And I believe that's psychologically helpful. Mm -hmm. Ritual is for the spiritual, energetical, but also for the person engaged in the ritual. Mm -hmm. uh, Two-way relationship between mm -hmm. yourself and the universe. Mm -hmm. So I developed a very simplified version of the Korean ancestral rites, which are elaborate, mm. to help people engage in these practices. And I teach these skills to adoptees, but just anybody who wants to connect. Wow. wow. It sounds amazing. And do you only talk to Korean ancestors or are ancestors the same everywhere? Ancestors are same everywhere. Sometimes when you come from a culture, even if you're an adoptee, from a culture that had a tradition of ancestral worship, mm -hmm. sometimes they're more easily accessible. Easier. Mm -hmm. So my German ancestors are probably locked away somewhere <laughs> deep in a dungeon. <laughs> It'd be hard but, to find them. <laughs> well, but we can find them. Okay. okay. <laughs> and the more that you do work towards it, you can be in relationship to them. And certainly everybody's ancestors are right there present, sure. whether we know them or not. Yeah. And other countries like my son's Japanese, that's a very connected culture, right? Yes, absolutely. They have the shrines and the, yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I believe they're always with us. Yeah, okay, very good. It's also beautiful, the Mexican tradition of Día de los Muertos. Is that, yes. is that all the same? It's the same thing, right? Well, I don't want to say same thing, not knowing uh, what are the specific yeah. traditions, but I think it's the same idea across the globe, cross-culturally. Right. Crossing the veil, right, okay. Yeah. Very good. Beautiful. Well, if somebody can't go to Korea with you, mm -hmm. what can adoptees especially do to mm -hmm. have a deeper connection with their ancestry? Mm -hmm. Is there anything we can do as lay people or is it dangerous? Like you get into hot water this way? No. Well, I mean, I know that a lot of people have fears about engaging in spiritual practices. But I really want to emphasize an important point that there's nothing to fear. Mm -hmm. 
I want to normalize the practice of spirituality and ancestral rituals. Mm. They're a normal part of our lives. And in Korea, even if somebody's not necessarily spiritual, if they grew up in a family where they did ancestral rites regularly, it's just part of their daily living. Okay. And I think it's good practice. Mm. Maybe you're not going on the pilgrimage with me, but I'm creating multiple opportunities where people can engage this way. Just want to spend a little time on the ceremony I did in Denmark. Okay, yeah. There's something remarkable happened around that. I suppose it took my whole adult life for that mm. to come to fruition. So one day and two months ago, I offered my first shamanic ceremony in Denmark. Okay. Denmark is the country of my husband. The motherland of my husband and we go back frequently every year and i've been going back since we were married in 2006 okay. but i have never offered a ceremony hmm. until just recently and as i started planning for it i just knew time was now okay and then a very interesting set of things happened that mm-hmm. i'm still thinking about it mm-hmm. i'm so in awe of spirits and what's unfolded. So when I put the ceremony together, I had no idea that Denmark took in so many Korean adoptees. Mm. So Korea adopted out close to 200,000 children since the 50s. Most of them were adopted in the 70s and 80s all throughout the Western world. Mm -hmm. Apparently, Denmark has one of the highest transnational adoption rates in the world. And they have one of the highest number of Korean adoptees, about 9,000. Wow. I would never have guessed that in a million years. (laughs) And I didn't know either, Beth. Wow. Wow. In the fall of 23, just last fall in September, the New York Times and The Guardian both posted a huge article about the very abusive ways that children were sent out of the country. Mm-hmm. And the leaders leading that cause and going back to Korea to get answers about their adoption histories was led by Danes. Oh, interesting. Okay. So it was all Denmark and here's this little tiny country. I didn't know much about it when I met my husband and then I was married for many years to him. And then now I was offering an ancestral ceremony there and all this was happening as I was planning the ceremony. It's all brewing. Okay. Wow. Wow. And then the week of the ceremony, January 20th, both Norway and Denmark stopped all international adoptions. Wow. So I was a piece of something larger that I had no idea about. Interesting. Fascinating. And the adoptees that were participating probably were celebrating that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh. And so in the room were, of course, white Danes who are interested in connecting. I work mm-hmm. with anybody and everybody who wants to make a connection. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, the Korean adoptees were there. And then I have some indigenous friends from Greenland. Okay. Denmark brutally colonized Greenland. Mm. And they have, of course, adoptees from Greenland. Okay. But these are coerced adoptions, not very ethically done. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. practically stolen. Mm -hmm. And I have one friend who was an adoptee who just wrote a book about her experiences. Her name is Kalenguak, and she made these earrings for me, so I'm wearing them today. Yeah. Thank you. Uh And she wrote a book called Little about her early adoption experiences. Mm -hmm. And so all these energies were there. And I had no idea. I didn't know who was going to come to the ceremony. I don't have a network in Denmark. I'm just a Korean-American woman who would come... But they came and my friend came all the way from South Korea to assist with the music. Wow. And another musician who was trained by him also flew in from Switzerland. Wow. And supported the ceremony. Wow. So all this came together in a way that I couldn't imagine. Wow. Yeah. You couldn't have scripted that like that. I mean, it's like the stars all aligned right there for you. Mm-hmm. I bet that was a powerful ceremony. And you're doing another one in October in Korea, right? Yes. So several events are already in the works. In October, I will be taking uh, another group to Korea for a pilgrimage. And we do a ceremony when we go. And we do a temple stay at a Buddhist temple. There are hundreds of them in Korea. And of course, some fun activities as well. But it's really for personal and ancestral healing. And then next year, I'm going back to Denmark in 2025 during summer solstice, 21st and 22nd. Mm. I'll be doing a two-day shamanic event. Mm. If people are traveling or from Europe, they can also come Mm -hmm. to Denmark and experience the ceremonies there too. Mm. 
Nice. And they're all open to adoptees and non-adoptees. Yes, anyone. Just anybody who wants to connect with their ancestors. Mm -hmm. All right. So I'm just thinking that this is going to be so helpful to people that have tried everything. (laughs) They've tried all the things, Mm. all the Western modalities, all the Mm. things. And maybe this might open up just different way of healing for people, a deeper healing perhaps. Mm -hmm. So I hope people would look into it, think about it, look into your work or how do you find people that are working with ancestors that are reputable? (laughs) (laughs) Well, there are many people doing the work now. And I think a simple Google search will get you providers and start with whatever is in front of you and available. Okay. There's no perfect way to do it. Okay. It's just a trusting process of who arrives. Mm -hmm. Would a psychic, is that the same thing or is that something different? Sure. Psychic mediums sometimes profess to have abilities to see beyond what we experience. Mm -hmm. I think we have to be careful a bit. You have to follow your intuition. Mm -hmm. I know that there are talented psychics and mediums out in the world. It's just that there are very few of them who are authentic and not out for some ulterior motive. Yeah. So being very (laughs) careful and you just trust your heart, your gut? I suppose. And I think referrals are good, you know, if you have friends. Mm -hmm. But here's my really important teaching about spirituality. My goal when I work with individuals is to help them develop their own skills that they can trust themselves. Mm. So I encourage people, even in the ceremony space, to not look to me only. I am a person who can trigger your own internal healing system. Okay. That's what I believe. So there's nothing necessarily magic about you. You're just a conduit, a helper to get them more in touch with their own inner wisdom. Yes. So my goal is to boost your healing system Uh so that you can trust yourself to heal yourself. And this way we don't get into power issues where you're going to just be reliant on the person external to you for answers because it's a never ending process to always rely on somebody else for authority. But I'm trying to help you build your own spiritual authority. So I like teaching the techniques, teaching the rituals. I will provide the setting Mm -hmm. in which the healing can take place, but I want you to heal yourself. Ah, You're working yourself out of a job. I see. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, Well, this is fascinating. I, Gal, I hope someday my son and I can can work on this with you. This sounds amazing. And I just wish you all the best with all of your work with adoptees and other people too. And I'm really glad I know you. And how can people get a hold of you or sign up for your pilgrimage? Mm -hmm. What's the best way? Well, you can look at my website, helenasoholm.com. I have all my events listed there. I'm active on all the social media, Facebook, Instagram. I post all my events there. You can find me there as well. Okay. And I'll include all those links in the show notes. Is there anything else that you would like to say that I haven't brought up? Well, thank you for including me in your podcast because I am not an adoptee. I don't have a specialty working with them. And I know very little about the adoption community, Mm -hmm. but I humbly do my work to support whoever needs supporting from me. And if I can help adoptees, specifically people in my own culture, because I'm a part of that karma Mm -hmm. that happened in our country. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to support anybody who needs help in this area. But it's really about finding ourselves. Who are we, identity, and how can we exist in the world peacefully? Mm -hmm. And there are so many ways to do that. So trust yourself Mm -hmm. and don't be afraid to Mm -hmm. try new things. Mm, that's beautiful. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for being here and helping us all understand this a little bit better. And and I hope that you will continue learning more about the adoption community. It's rich and beautiful and full of pain <laughs> and mm. growth. We're all mm-hmm. adoptive parents like me included, trying to do better and trying to learn and become more authentic. So thank you for being a piece of this. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And everyone, please... Share this episode with anyone you think who might be interested in Helena's work or just kind of opening their minds to what else is out there that can help us spiritually. And thank you all for listening. And Helena and I want you all to stay Stay safe. safe.